watching Shalom TV, celebrating Jewish culture. Paula Griss is a child Holocaust survivor from Chernovitz, Romania. When Paula was four years old, she was sent, along with her mother and baby sister, to a concentration camp in the Transnistria region that had been Ukraine and was occupied by the Germans. There she spent the next two years of her life. This is Paula's story. She now lives in Atlanta, Georgia, where she created a program called Ner Tamid, Eternal Light a program to help teens who have participated in the March of the Living learn and share their knowledge with others. Paula, what's your earliest memory? My earliest memory is, um, involves my, the, my, my sister's birth, which was actually, my mother was um, pregnant when my father was taken away. And so she was, um, she remained alone with m with me, and she was pregnant. So, by the time, by that time, uh, the um, actually the Romanian authorities had put into place uh, a number of the uh, the laws, uh, anti-Jewish laws that had been in place in Germany since 1938, and among those was a. Um, curfew. Jews were not allowed to be on the street past six o'clock in the evening. And uh, Jews were not uh, allowed, were not, uh, could not be admitted into public hospitals. So um, my mother arranged with a midwife to come and help her when she went into labor, when and if she went into labor. I, uh, as a background to that, I have to say that my mother was originally from uh, Galicia. Uh, Chernovitz was only 40 kilometers away from the region where she was born and raised. And she was married somewhere, I, I'm not quite sure exactly, but I ge guess somewhere between 1936, 37, I was born in 1938. So she had not been in Chernovitz very long. She didn't have many uh, friends or, and so she was basically, when my father was taken away, uh, she didn't have a, a, a much of a support system, which is why she arranged for, for a midwife to come to her house to help her deliver the baby. Uh, as it happened, she went into labor when, uh, after the curfew was already in force, which meant that she wasn't really allowed in the streets, and the Jewish midwife was not allowed to come to her. And so um, my memory of that night was that she left me alone. Probably she did what most mothers would have done, which would have been to kiss me, to hug me, to say, I'll be back, don't worry, don't be afraid, but I have to leave now and she locked the door and went away. On her part of this journey, she, was, um, she went through streets where she later told me gendarmes, the gendarmes were the R Romanian police that were putting in force similar, um, similar hardships and punishments to Jews as, as the Germans did in, in the regions that they controlled. From my point of view, as, since you asked me about my memory, my memory was just standing frozen as a three-year-old little girl looking at the doorknob all night long. And um, it, was, it was probably the beginning of a long period of experiencing terror and fear and the sense of helplessness. 
You remember her coming home? Yes. The next morning, she delivered a little girl at the home of the midwife. She somehow miraculously evaded being shot at and, and assaulted and whatever. And she made it to the uh, house of the midwife and st stayed the night. And the next morning, she wrapped the baby up and carried her back and came home. When was your father taken away and by whom? My father was taken away actually or initially by the Russians because there was an exchange of, um, of occupations that because initially the Germans had a pact with the Russians and the Russians invaded uh, Germany, I mean invaded Romania. The, the part of Romania that I was in, Chernovitz, was part of a region called Bukovina. And the Russians occupied it first, and they arrested Jews for their own political reasons, either because they were considered capitalists or whatever. So my father was taken away by them. Then when, when that pact broke and the Romanians joined forces with, um, with the Germans, we didn't know what happened to him. He, he just never came back. We didn't find out until two years ago when Yad Vashem released its database and we were able to find one living relative on my father's side who had also been in Transnistria, who had been with my grandmother and with my aunt and had seen all of our relatives die or be shot. She had some word about what happened to my father. But until, until then, we just really didn't know whether he was shot by Germans, whether he was incarcerated, whether he was sent to Siberia. There were so many things that were um, so many, there were so many dangers for, for Jews in every situation, so many ways to fall into the pit. And he just never came back, but he was a presence in our life throughout the two years that we were in Transnistria because um, he, he was the hope that, that my mother held out for us as we were going through each, each day, day by day of months and years, that soon the war would be over, and soon Tatika would come back, and soon we would go back and retrieve our old life and get our old life back. So in a sense, even though I never saw my father again, um, my father was part of our hope. He was a candle. What did the relative tell you happened to your father? Well, Koka said that the Russians had sent my father along with the other Jews who had been imprisoned at that particular time, um, ha had sent him to Siberia, and later he was taken out to the front, and then just somebody came back and they said that they knew that he had been killed. We don't know really where he's buried or whether he was killed in a skirmish between the Russians and the Germans, whether he was impressed by the Germans into the army, whether he was imprisoned and then put into a concentration camp or shot. You know, we were in that area. Further on into the Ukraine is the infamous place called Babi Yar. We were on that track. Transnistria, then there was this vast area, and the Germans actually, the work that my mother did, working in the stone quarry and cutting rock, was to benefit the Germans' attack on Stalingrad, because their plan was to come through that area towards Russia. So we were in that region. Uh, my mother, who had been raised as the oldest daughter of a, of a, a well-to-do, indulgent father, had soft hands. 
She had never done anything but, you know, read books and cook delicious meals. And so those hands wound up working in a stone quarry as a, as a, not just a slave laborer, as a woman, a 20, she must have been by then 28 or 30. And um, it was not just, I want you to understand that to be in Transnistria, um, you were not just a, um, a slave laborer. You were material to die. So the people died there every single morning, every single day, because the, the existence was on a very low calorie uh, ration. You worked very hard. And everyone around, the Ukrainians, the, the peasants, everyone had power over you. They, they could beat you, they could rape you, they could do whatever they want with you. So from, from my perspective, when she left in the morning, I knew, even though I was only four years old and then later five years old, that she had no power to come back. She had no power to protect me and my sister. And yet, I, I depended on her nevertheless. So what else do you remember from before you were taken away? Uh, very little, actually. Uh, I think that um, I have, a, you know, like a vague backdrop of, of just living well, being a very happy family. My, uh, my mother had a place, at, um, you know, for vacation. She used, we used to go to the Black Sea. Uh, you know, it was a good life. What were your parents like religiously? How, was, how did they relate to their Judaism? Uh, my, my mother came from a very uh, traditional family, which is to say my grandfather was a businessman. He was a fur trader in an area where fur trading was a very, uh, a very needed commodity. He did very well. He, um, he was um, a vision to chassid, so that means that he davened in the vision to shul when he davened, and he was a religious man, a religious businessman. Um, my grandmother was a very pious lady, homemaker, had four children to whom she nurtured. My father went to shul on Shabbos. He, too, was a businessman. And my mother ran a very nice, what we would call now perhaps a modern Orthodox home, or uh, the Transnistria, uh, excuse me, Chernovitz was is a very famous Jewish city. It is famous for many things, but one of the reasons it's famous is that it had a very broad spectrum of Jewish life there. The first international Yiddish conference in the world was held in Chern Chernovitz, so many writers wrote about it, many people. It's included in the literature, in the Jewish literature. It produced people like Paul Salon, who was a famous author and poet and writer at, who survived Transnistria also. It produced, um, it, it, it was a, a, a city to take note of. So um, my, my grandfather actually set my father up in business. This is what another part of the family history that I learned from this cousin. Um, and he was in the beginning of starting a career. And, uh, and you know, during those years, p Jewish people had the thought that they were making progress into being able to integrate their Jewishness into their general into the general world, in the same way that people have that notion now in America. So, so you have no real memories of your father that are set. No, I have a picture of my father, and my mother, and my grandmother, and myself as an infant. Um, and I mean myself as an infant and my mother and father holding me and my grandmother standing over there and it was taken in 1938 or 
yeah, probably 1938. And it's like this little cameo of a perfect image of life before the destruction. And so I see him in my mind because of that photograph. But I don't remember him. I don't remember him physically. So, so basically, your childhood consisted of this entire experience. So tell us about the day they took you away. Well, the first major transport from, tr from Chernovitz took place on Sukkot. The Germans, the Romanians, they always had a way of gathering Jews together when they were celebrating their holidays. So uh, in, on Sukkot, anyway, th there was a major transport that was leaving in November of 1941. Many Jews were, were sent to Transnistria. They were piled onto the cattle cars. They were sent across the Bug River. It, it was all going eastward days. November was the coldest month on record in, in many, many years. So many of the Jews who were on that transport died in transit because it was j partly it was the trains with no food, no water, no, but also there was forced marches along that stretch also, and they had to cross the rivers and the streams. We would have been on that transport uh, if it were not for a little piece of paper about this big. A copy of it is at the Bremen right now on the wall. And that piece of paper was an exemption that was written by the mayor of Chernovitz. Um, it exempted my mother and my sister and I from that particular transport in November of 1941. And the reason for the, the, the wh why he was able to exempt her was because she was not a, a citizen. She was a Polish citizen, pa Tryon Popovici, who was the mayor of Chernovitz, is one of the righteous Gentiles honored by Yad Vashem. There is a plaque of his at Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. He, he evidently wanted to do what he could for whoever. My mother, being as resourceful as she was, somehow was able to get to him. My sister was born in August. She was able to get to him perhaps in October. or No, I think this little uh, piece of paper, which I call in Yiddish a, a settler, is dated November 1941. The reason I mention that and why it's so significant is that if we had been on that transport in November 1951, 1941, my sister would certainly not have survived. She was three months old with very little body fat, Remember that it was the coldest winter on record. Everyone, old people and children, r died along the way. So, so that little piece of paper saved us from going on that transport. And some of the facts that I know about that transport, are, I didn't get necessarily from our cousin in Israel, but from the head archivist at the um, Holocaust Museum in Washington. He's done a great deal of research on Transnistria. And when I brought him this little piece of paper, I had an, uh, a meeting with him, and I brought him this little piece of paper and my birth certificate and told him where we were. He put the whole thing in context from his scholarly point of view. And he said, he, he, he told me personally that he doesn't understand how the three of us survived, where we were, and when we were. So going back to the leaving of, of Chernovitz, by June of 1941, this little piece of uh, exemption no longer had any power. The powers that be in Chernovitz and in Romania and the forces that wanted all the Jews out had overridden any protective power we were sent on, on that transport. Um, the same researcher who gave me uh, this information allowed me to go through archival microfiche one day. And I sat for several hours going through pieces of paper 
thinking that this was useless work when lo and behold I fell upon a sheet of paper like this that had my name and my sister's name and my mother's name with our ages and the date of our transport. They, t they wrote it in beautiful handwritten letters and it says across the top in Romanian, the transport on June 7, 1941 of the Jews of Chernovitz and it lists, lists their names, ages, occupations, and address. So I, I have, I ha it, it, for me, it was a very important thing because all the things I'm telling you, I knew from conversations with my mother. I knew them, you know. But, uh, but as you grow up, you begin to doubt whether what you know is really true, what you know is really, you know, the real story. Anyway, that's the, that's the story. So we, we were sent to Transnistria on the same kind of uh, transport, but it was June, so it meant that it wasn't as cold, thank God. It was, my sister was nine months old instead of three months old. There was more of a chance for us to, to survive. What was it like when you arrived? It was always dark. I mean, my, my days, those days, those weeks, those months, those years that we spent there are just um, a very long darkness. I don't remember, I don't remember very much of it except sheltering my sister, waiting for my mother to come back, uh, not crying, being, being a caregiver to my sister and being as grown up as I possibly could be, which meant trying to, to, um, to stay uh, brave. Like children who are lost in a, f in, a, in a shopping mall or something and they're looking for their mother. I think sometimes, you know, they're, they, they're terrified inside. I feel their terror inside of me. Were there other children there that you knew? Originally, they were children, of course. Those lists of people included children. They included people who were 60 and 70 and 80 and 30 and 28. But the children very quickly died. Many of them died. And many children, uh, and you know, there were a few that remained uh, scattered. Uh, I think I told you when you were at our home that in 1940, 43. Um, the, the international, I think it was 1943, that's a guess on my part, but somewhere in between, clo closer to the part before the war was over, um, a delegation of Red Cross, International Red Cross women came to rescue the, Romanian, uh, the remaining Jews in, in um, in Transnistria, or the, no, no, excuse me, not the remaining Jews, but the remaining Jewish children. It was a gesture on, on the International Red Cross part. So what I remember is these rounded figures, like, I, I think they were, to me, they, because they, they were people who had flesh on them, they were, they, they were wearing white, uniforms, they had caps on, and they brought little goodie bags for to, t to present to the children. And my mother, uh, I don't know how the word was passed that they were there, but they were in a little hut, and er the children were supposed to be brought to them to be taken out of Transnistria. Uh, my mother brought us both, my sister, being an infant, for some reason, did not qualify age-wise or something. So um, my mother wanted me to leave. You know, she wanted one of us at least to survive. But I, um, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that if I left, my sister would be lost. I was abandoning my baby if I left, and so I. Um, 
they gave me the candy. It was very tempting. It was very uh, enticing to be going away. They said, come, it's going to be nice. You'll go on a train. Whatever the people say to adults say to children to make them want to do what they don't want to do. But uh, I said, I'm not going. Whatever I, I remember really saying to my mother, whatever will happen to you will happen to me, but I'm not going. And I guess um, I had had enough training in being a little adult that eventually I won out and I stayed. And um, so I, I, um, my sis I continued to do what, what, what was my role to do. And um, we lived to see the end. Did those children reach safety? One to there were de various reports later after the war. The parents who survived had some difficulty finding where their children were. I remember vaguely hearing that there was a train derailment. I don't know what really happened. You know, we, after the war, the war didn't really end for us. The war ended in a manner of speaking because the Russian front came through because they were advancing now and the Germans were retreating. And so we were left without a map to guide us, without anyone there to, uh, to support or help us to get out of where we were. And so there was no way to know what happened to people. You know, everyone stayed frozen for a while and then started to walk through the fields that were just as dangerous, practically, as they had been when, when we were actually being occupied, so to speak. Because the, the fields and the farmers around who were not Jewish still had the same animosity, the same hatred, the same um, desire to loot and to take advantage and to, to add their blows to whoever survived. So we, we, we wanted to go back to Chernovitz to see who had survived, to find well, out. Let me ask, when you, waited, when you and your sister waited for your mother during the day, what, where exactly were you waiting? Was it a barracks? Was it a room? Was it a? It was a house. It was a sort of abandoned house. It wasn't a house like we know a house to be a brick and mortar and paint, but it was some kind of a, a house structure with a pot-bellied stove in the middle, and sometimes people would throw a piece of wood in it and make a fire. You see, it wasn't the systematic... Transnistria was not the systematic killings that people have come, uh, become accustomed to in the German fashion, which was you get on the trains, you go links, right, this, that, and you go to work, and you go to the crematorium, and you go uh, to the gas chambers in the crematorium. It was a, um, a slower but a much more uh, sinister death because um, because it was designed to extract the last amount of energy, and, and death just happened, so that there was an economy involved here. They weren't going to, they, they had already taken everything that pe of, of possessions. Now they were taking the human energy, and uh, no medicines, no food, no, you know, very little food, very little anything. So, so that's what happened. So it sounds like that managed to strangle any sense of community or anything Exactly. Jewish? There was very little sense of community where we were. There were some camps in Transnistria that were organized. They were closer to, they were more towards the west. They were closer to where folks had originally left from. And they did have some kind of communal structures there. and. Um, and communication with the with with the outside world, I know that from my readings. But uh, where we were, it was much more. The the farthest end out were the Einsatzgruppen, so they had already mowed down uh, 
hundreds of thousands of, of Jews. So you were there altogether two years? Almost. Exactly, or well, I'm years? not sure exactly when the, the Russian front came, when the war ended, but I suspect it was somewhere about around April. So it was maybe short a month or two of two years. So what happened on that day? You woke up one morning? No, I didn't wake up one morning. It was actually a, a night. We were hearing sh shooting and uh, seeing the, the lights of, of um, bombs going off and shooting and a lot of noise. And then we were, we were like whoever was remaining, I think, all huddled together in a sort of basement space. And it was pouring rain outside, and it was dark. And we could see from the cracks, we could see the German soldiers retreating, running through our camp. And, and shortly afterwards, the Russians pursuing them, the Russian army, the uh, Russian battalion, or whatever you call it, pursuing them right on their heels. And this is, um, this is a peculiar kind of memory I have of that because I was six by then. And just as I had told you, I understood so well the powerlessness of, of our situation in, in Transnistria, even though we weren't surrounded by barbed wire, or we weren't surrounded by, we had no place to go. The, even though there was no barbed wire around us, we knew that we were surrounded by enemies, human enemies, all around, so that there was no place to go. But on that night, I also realized that the limits of power, because suddenly I saw the Germans running and, and fearing for their own life, just like we had been fearing for our life just a very short time ago. And it was just a child's observation. It was an observation because when you're a child in that situation and you haven't really internalized what real life is like, what, what being an adult, what you can look forward to, then everything you see is a lesson in life. And everything I saw in those two years was a very scary lesson in life. Tell me about your mother. <sighs> my story is really about my mother because um, my mother's resourcefulness and her, thank God, her, her, her mixture of faith and strength um, brought us through some, uh, you know, we, we read yesterday, this past Shabbat, we read about Parshat Noah and how uh, Noah, Noah and his family were the last to be saved uh, in, in this great uh, flood. And it was because of um, God's judgment of, hu of the human condition at the time. And I think that um, we were in a similar kind of destruction uh, caused by uh, uh, a, a, a man-made destruction. And we were this little, little boat and, and my, my mother was certainly the, the captain of the boat. So she, number one, she somehow managed to get that little piece of paper. She tried in every which way to find out where my father was. When, when the war was over, she knew intuitively that we had to somehow make it back to Chernovitz to find out who had survived. And somehow she got us back there safely. We hitchhiked, we slept in, in barns, we, we, you know, but I don't know how she did it, but she, I mean, if I imagine myself as a, as a parent, uh, or I look at my, my grandchildren at, at the age that I was, and I think of myself trying to cope with all the dangers from without, and still take care of children in some manner or form. Of course, she lost her patience. Of course, she was 
anxious and worried. But when we got back to Chernovitz, she, um, she managed to do what was necessary. And then she made again a, a, um, a very critical decision to leave there. And we left just before the Iron Curtain because the, the Chernovitz became uh, part of the Russian, uh, well, the Iron Curtain came down. Had we stayed there a very short time longer, we probably would not have emerged until the 1960s. This cousin whom we met in, in Israel uh, two years ago waited 14 years after they came back from from Transnistria, they too went back to Chernovitz to see who had survived. Or they went, they didn't go back to Chernovitz, they went to, to their little village outside of Chernovitz. And then they were lo effectively locked behind the Iron Curtain. They waited 14 years to get a visa to go to Israel. And so we, my mother made the decision after she took inventory, we saw that there was nothing left of our possessions, our apartment, my father's business. But most importantly, my father didn't come back. My mother's two sisters and brother were gone. She, all the extended families whom I don't even know of, even this Coca whom we just met, nobody was there. So she made the decision to get on trains and we went eventually to the American zone of occupation, which was where we spent the next six, seven years in the displaced persons camps, what, what's known the DP camps. And um, then we came to America. You spoke of your mother's extraordinary uh, resourcefulness and faith. Uh, she retained her faith in God through all this? She retained her faith in God over the faith in mankind. I would say she retained a strong her her strong strong commitment not commitment uh, belief in Eretz Israel her her attachment to it my mother was a halutza I I forgot to tell you but my mother had intended before she met my father she had learned Hebrew she had intended to make to become part of the issue to to live in Israel, to, uh, and she was uh, part of a very small group of friends who were staunch Zionists in their little town in, in Galicia, and they had planned to live in Israel and to become halutzim, to build the land. This was before uh, Israel was a state. So, uh, what, you know, what happened is what, what happens. People, sometimes you take a tangent in, in your life and it becomes your main road. She met my father and she married and things went the opposite way. But after the war, very definitely she, she retained that strong feeling. How and long did it take you from the time the camp was emptied of the Germans by the Russians? How long did it take you to get back to Chernovitz? How long did it take us to get back to Chernovitz? I, it seems to me that it took us weeks or months, but I don't know. It could have been just one week. You know, as a, one of the things about my childhood, my, about all those years, is that they had no date and no time. There was no timeline. There were no birthdays. There were no significant days to celebrate. It was all one long black tunnel where change was the only thing that was um, understood or, or not surprising. Uh, nothing, nothing really surprised me after a while, but nothing was ever um, noticeable or worthy of notice because it was all going to change again soon. So until I was 10 years old, that's really, I don't know time. I don't know, I, don't, I d didn't measure time. I only know it by looking back on. So you were in the DP camp from what year to what year? Well, we, we came to the American Zone 1946, I think. 
And you were there for how many years? We were there for the most of seven years. I came to America in 1951. But in between time, we made a, um, we immigrated to England actually for one year. It was a, uh, it was, didn't work out, as they say. It just, it was just one of those things that didn't work out. My mother had an aunt who had married an Englishman and had moved to England before the war. And when she discovered that one of her nieces had survived with two little children, she was childless and she said, please come, I'll send you papers. And um, so in 1948, we went to England. And uh, Britain had very strange uh, visa requirements also, so the only way my mother could come was as a housemaid. She got a visa to come to uh, England to be my, my aunt's, her aunt's housemaid, uh, which, you know, whatever. It, it didn't matter at the time because we were looking for a place that would be permanent, that would give us security. But while we were on our way to England, this Tante Anna died. So when we came to England, she actually didn't live on the mainland. She lived on a very small island between England, and, between the mainland and Ireland. And so we traveled to this little tiny island. Which island was that? It's called the Isle of Man. And we traveled to the Isle of Man. And um, it was actually the, um, the happiest experience of my, of my entire life. But it was not to, uh, to be because, number one, my mother again realized that um, we were all alone and this was no place to, to raise two Jewish little girls. There was nothing there for us. And furthermore, she could only stay if she remained in that place and uh, continued to work as a housemaid. So in a as hard as it is to imagine, she, the quota system from England to America at that time for people who fell into our category was 10 years. So she made another critical decision. We were going to go back to the DP camps and declare ourselves again displaced persons camps, uh, displaced persons, and apply again to come to the United States. So in 1949, uh, we returned to one of the DP camps, re-registered, and applied again for admission to the United States. And um, now your mother was no longer interested in moving to Israel at that point. Well, you have to remember that the Arabs had attacked Israel right at that time, right at that time, and here she was. She had already lived through ten years of of struggle with two little girls. Had there been peace, had the, you know, th we can speculate all kinds of things, but I'm convinced that if Eretz Yisrael had been established and there hadn't been uh, an immediate attack upon it, that she probably would have chosen to go to Israel and probably would have had, would have had a role to play in the building of, of Eretz Yisrael. Uh, but she was overcome. She was overwhelmed by that time. She was truly overwhelmed and needed, and she wanted safety and security for her children, as any parent wants is safety and security for her children. When I came to America, I was 13, and my sister was 10, 11. So, you know, it, it was a hard, it was a very, very stormy sea that she had come through. And I'm sure people ask all the time why you feel such a remarkable thing happened that a three-year-old and a nine-month-old survived this experience. Yes, there are two things people ask me. And one of them is, well, well, no, the first thing people say is, oh, you were a child, you probably don't remember anything. 
which is, um, you know, surprises me because everybody has memories of childhood. Mine are just different. Uh, and the other thing is that I have always felt that um, God had a role in my life. I think my mother had that feeling. I, uh, I think yesterday, yesterday my, my little granddaughter was welcomed into, my, my youngest little granddaughter was welcomed into the world by a group of friends and, and extended family. And her name is Nava Etka. My mother's name was Etka. And my son, when he named her, spoke very beautifully. He, he uh, gave a beautiful tribute to my mother at her naming. Um, but I had a very interesting memory yesterday. And um, when the war was over and we finally came to those DP camps, we, we had access you know, like people call access, access to, to things again. We could get medical assistance, which we hadn't had for 10 years. We could do other things, you know. The first thing my mother did was, I was born, at my birth I had an umbilical hernia. And, you know, who thinks about an umbilical hernia during when you're in concentration camp, when you're being driven like cattle from one place to the other? But as soon as we came to those DP camps and we had access to medical assistance, my mother didn't think about going to the dentist, going to the eye doctor. She said, Paula has a, an umbilical hernia. We have to fix it so that she'll be able to have children. And that was a very powerful message to me always. I mean, thank God I've had five children, but I didn't have to think about it. There were certain things that my mother did and said, and that, that came back to me yesterday when we were sitting and, and, and enjoying and welcoming this new little girl that, that bears, and that is my mother's great granddaughter. My mother did, never dreamt that she would have great granddaughters named after her. One lives in Israel who's named after her, and one lives here in New York, soon to be living somewhere else, and uh, ultimately probably also in Israel. So how many grandchildren you have now, so far? Baruch Hashem, poo poo poo, I have eight. At the age of 13, after having your entire childhood virtually stolen from you, you arrive in America, what was it like? It was a lot of things. It was, um, at first, it seemed like just another one of those changes that I had got grown accustomed to, you know? Who knows what will happen next? What can you trust? What can you, um, you know, what can you place trust in? But it was also opportunity. It was an opportunity, first of all, to, um, to put all that behind me, to, um, to become somebody, to become something and somebody. And the New York public school system gave me that opportunity. I, um, I, I immersed myself in, in reading and learning. I mean, I had no idea how society worked, what you did in a classroom. Uh, how you how a girl is supposed to dress and um, you know play was certainly not part of my early childhood curriculum, but I learned to read. Oh, there was that was another thing that my mother did in those DP camps. Besides fixing my umbilical hernia, she also hired a German tutor immediately. Someone from the neighborhood in in that vicinity of the DP camps to teach us, my sister and I, arithmetic, you know, reading and writing and arithmetic. So I knew a little bit. And on that little bit, I built and I, um, I made a good student out of myself. And otherwise, what was it like? Um, it was just like, you know, climbing a mountain. You had to learn how to 
how to do things in an American way. We were, we were immigrants, you know? Nobody called uh, a, a refugee. We were, actually, we were called refugees. Nobody called anyone survivors. And um, being a refugee in America in the 1950s, especially being a single mom with, uh, with and for me, being part of a family that did not have a father was a very, um, was a very big handicap. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, you didn't count for anything in, in American society as a single mom or as a, um, or as a, as a, uh, as a child of a family that didn't have a father, didn't really fit so well in the Jewish community or the general community. I didn't have somebody who went to shul and davened on that side right. so that I could feel like I have a place on this side. L one last question. So I guess you're, you'd say really you started your new life when you met your husband. How did that happen? How did it happen is that, um, you know what they say, God makes the shaduchim, God puts people together. We happened to have gotten a job in a day camp together one summer. He was already, a, 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 you know, he had graduated college, so he was a senior counselor and I was a junior counselor. I had schedule. finagled my way into a junior counselor position in a, in a day camp in, in New York in, um, oh, I forgot the name, somewhere upstate New the York. The Jewish day camp. Jewish day camp run by a, a Y or something. So, uh, and, and, uh, yeah, and so we began our life together and, uh, and only after many years of, um, of living, you know, living just as an ordinary person, I was um, able to pull back the curtain and and go back to thinking and and um, reclaiming that part the that part of my history that actually formed who I am now and uh, I was I don't know what made me do it but. Uh, last Thursday or Friday's uh, New York Times carried a, a, an obituary of um, the man who organized the first gathering of Holocaust survivors in Jerusalem in 1981. And uh, that was the beginning of, of us refugees and to begin to come together and this was the first gathering of Holocaust survivors took place in Jerusalem in 1981 right after Shavuos. For some reason I felt I had to go. I had no idea why but I went because it was an opportunity to stand with my people and it was actually the beginning of my, um, of my reclaiming process. But that was the most incredible homecoming for all of us survivors. And I can't tell you, well, it was like all, all of us who came that then had the same feeling that God had put his hand into the fire and pulled out seeds to reseed the world. And um, yeah, so I, I cried a lot for my mother then too because I think she should have had the, the schus to live long enough to be at that place at that time. But I was there instead. Paula, can thank you enough for sharing your story, um, for becoming such a person after what you've been through. It's an inspiration to everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.
We'd love to know your response to this Shalom TV program. Please be in touch with us to share your thoughts and comments. You may do so by visiting our website at www.shalomtv.com or by writing us at Post Office Box 1989, Fort Lee, New Jersey, 07024.